one of the things that you're going to be hearing from Colin today is about feelings. And so Colin, I wanted to start the conversation with a little question for you. And I think a lot of us would agree that we've seen in, in business to consumer in that world these days, we see businesses yeah. taking a lot into account about how their customers feel and how yeah. the experiences they're having with their brand is. And they spend a lot of time and effort there. My question is, in the business to business arena, is that as much of a focus? Is it necessary? Do we really need to care about the feelings, the emotions, the experience that those other business customers have with us? Yeah, good, good question, James. Uh, and I guess my, my answer is, uh, as long as your customers are human beings, uh, then you need to think about it. If they're aliens from Mars, then you, I don't know, is the honest answer. Um, but the reality is that this is probably one of the, the most common questions that we get. Uh, people in the business-to-business -business world, for some reason, think that a lot of customer experience and how a customer feels is, is not appropriate for them or the question we get is the question you've asked. Um, but it absolutely is. I mean, if you just think about the fact that uh, organizations, business to business, typically talk about building a relationship with customers. Uh, and they employ account managers, people like that, to build that relationship. You know, a relationship is founded upon customer emotions. Uh, and therefore, it, it absolutely applies. Uh, in, in So everything we're going to be talking about today is not just about business to consumer. It absolutely applies in the business to business environment as well. And, and I've heard Colin uh, others speak about not my idea at all, but the idea that you know businesses don't buy from other businesses. It's people buying from people. And Correct. And that, uh, so folks, we're going to give you hopefully some ideas to think about and, and chew on and, and hopefully maybe even implement some changes in your organization to make that customer connection, especially again, if you're business to business. So my name is James Hilliard, very happy to be on board as the moderator for this event. Ginny and Sanjay out there, Joanna, Greg and everyone else. My role is to keep an eye on your questions and comments. So if you have those questions for us and comments, we'll move forward on the slide and just remind you what the Q&A box looks like. That's where you'll submit your questions and comments. And I'll pop on in from time to time to share some of those if needed. And then we'll definitely have some Q&A time towards the end as well. If you want to share on Twitter, absolutely. We've got some handles that we'll share out there with you. In fact, I will copy and paste these as well call into the entire audience and there is the entire and the paste and the send folks so you've got these at Hilly Prods is mine at go to assist is our sponsor and at Colin Shaw underscore CX uh, and you can reach out and connect with uh, Colin let's talk a little bit about his background here so you know who he is you heard a little bit of kind of the ideas that you'll be hearing from Colin today in 2002 he founded Beyond Philosophy it's a global customer experience consultancy He's got four best-selling books to his name, 210,000 connections on LinkedIn, led LinkedIn to name him as one of the top 150 business influencers worldwide. If you're familiar with Brand Quarterly Magazine, an online mag, they named him a top 50 marketing thought leader over the age of 50. They Not want sure to I love that bit. Yeah, well, you barely made it, as, as we can uh, see there. So, uh, hey, hey, he's got the wisdom and the experience. And, and I said in the beginning, a, a thought leader, but a practitioner as well. This isn't just someone who's thought about it. This is someone who puts it into action as well and still does that with the teams he works with. And, and finally, I, I was asking Colin ahead of time, like, well, why do you really care much about this? And he shared with me that he does believe, probably something a lot of us do believe, that a lot of customer experiences out there, I'll use the word, suck. He said they weren't great. I'm going to say some of them really just suck out there. We don't have great customer experiences. And, and he really hopes that some of the ideas he has and he shares with teams, shares with us today, will make those experiences better and ultimately really improve people's lives. We won't be as angry maybe the next time we're working with or buying something with someone or in a selling situation. So uh, that is the idea. Again, I'm going to keep an eye, Frank and Carmen and others, on your questions and comments. I'm going to shut down my webcam to do so. As I pop it back on throughout the presentation, we'll have a few interactions, Colin. But with that, the floor is yours. Looking forward to uh, to the presentation. Thank you, um, and thank you, um, 
um, go to assist and concierge for inviting me today um, a bit more a little bit about my background um, uh, is I used to run uh, call centers for British Telecom um, and I used to have three and a half thousand people working for me so as you guys start to consider go to assist and concierge um, then uh, you know been there done that uh, and uh, and know this well so as we go into this, in fact, my story actually starts from when um, back in 2001, when my boss turned around to me and said, "Colin, I'd like you to improve the customer experience and do it at least cost." Have you ever noticed that little bit that they always throw in at the beginning? You know, um, doing a, a, a least cost. Um, so we spent some time trying to work that out and this work out really what a customer experience is. And and what we've discovered is that for us. The key word here is the word experience. Okay, uh, your customers have many. Uh, you, people have many experiences. You have vacation experiences. You have social experiences. You have family experiences. You have employee experiences. Uh, but you you also have customer experiences. And the important part I'm trying to get across here is, as we've said at the beginning, you know, huge shock. Your customers are people. So the key becomes understanding customers as people uh, before um, you can start to uh, design an effective experience. So for us, a customer experience is broken into four bits, and we'll talk about this as we go. But headlines are, it's about the physical things, it's about emotional things, it's about subconscious, and it's about psycholo psychological things. And again, we'll we'll talk about this uh, as we go into this. But why is this important today? Well, what we are seeing is we're seeing a number of organizations and we are seeing many of our, our, our new clients coming to us and they're basically coming to us and saying this. They're saying, hey, you know, we put a net promoter program in place some time ago. We got some increases, that's great. But you know what? Um, it's starting to plateau, um, and you know it, we haven't got the gains that we uh, should be uh, getting over the last few months, uh, last year. And they're starting to say, well, you know, how do I move my customer experience to the next level? And the issue is that organisations have got this glass ceiling in place. Um, it, 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 they've got this sort of a current thinking in place that is effectively keeping them you know under the uh, under this glass ceiling and what we've got to do is we've got to break through the glass ceiling um, you can see where you want to go you know you, your net, net promoter your customer satisfaction score is is plateauing you know you've got to get to the future but how can you get to the future well the issue is this and this goes back to the famous Einstein quote that you can't solve your current problems uh, based upon the thinking that you you are using today, uh, you need new thinking, um, and hence this unlocking the hidden customer experience. Because what we've seen uh, is we've seen, you know, if I looked at evolution of customer experience over a period of time, and if you're as old as me and you know the top 50, uh, over 50. Um, then you'll remember Tom Peters and you'll remember the search of ex excellence which sort of kicked off the whole thing about customer satisfaction. Um, back in 1999, 1988 I think it was actually the experience economy and then we had um, uh, Reichelt starting to talk about net promoter um, and then uh, my book on DNA of customer experience, how emotions drives value uh, and that started to talk about this whole area of emotions. And then, I don't know if you've read this, but a great book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, written by a guy called Daniel Kahneman. Uh, Kahneman is, um, has won the Nobel Prize for Behavioral Economics. He is a, um, he's a professor. Um, and uh, you'll see later on today that um, we have written an ebook on this subject. Um, we are going to be giving you the code to download this ebook later on, free of charge. Um, so stay tuned for, for, for that and for me that sort of fits between this customer emotion bit and the Kahneman book and then next year I've got a new book coming out called The Intuitive Customer that moves all about this area of, of customer behavior 
and behavioral economics. And what I'm going to be doing today is I'm really going to be giving you a sneak peek into some of that latest thinking uh, that is going to um, break us through this glass ceiling. So let's take a step back and let's think about a customer experience and what we actually mean by a customer experience. Because when you start to look at a customer experience, a customer experience typically, you know, most organizations look at the top part of this iceberg. They look at the rational, conscious part of an experience. So rational things are like how quickly you answer the phone in the, in the call center, how many channels that you have, what's the wait time, average call handling time, you know, all those rational things that, that we know and love. Uh, and we, they typically organizations look at the conscious side of, of an experience. But what we know is that over 50% of a customer experience is about how a customer feels, the emotions, whether it's in B2B or business to uh, consumer. Uh, and, and most of our activity is driven by this bottom part of the iceberg, by emotions, the way we feel, and a subconscious uh, experience. So what do we um, mean by these sort of emotions? This goes back to my, my book, um, uh, DNA of Customer Experience, How uh, Emotions Drive Value. And what we discovered was that there are 20 emotions that drive and destroy value for an organization. So 20 emotions, and you can see them here, destroying cluster, um, these things will, will destroy value for you. And when I say value, I mean net promoter scores or um, uh, customer satisfaction or spend or retention. Then there's this attention cluster of emotions. This is effectively what marketing do. This, these are things like interested, exploratory. Then we have the recommendation cluster, cluster and the advocacy cluster. And these are the things that you need to focus on driving with your customers um, if, you are to, uh, if you are to gain them uh, long term uh, and therefore affect things like recommendation, net promoter, those types of things. So here's the thing. This is good stuff, probably more than you're doing today, but not good enough. Okay. The interesting thing for us and the interesting thing for me has been over the last few years is going, well, emotions are interesting, you know, so we have the rational side, we have emotions, they're interesting, but what causes an emotion? What is it that a customer, you know, why, does, why do people feel things? So let me ask you this question. Take a look at this screen and think about, if you would, what are the things that are, that, um, uh, that would make you not walk down this alley. So think about the fact, you know, have you ever gone to walk down this darkened alley like this and you've thought to yourself, maybe this isn't a good idea, maybe I shouldn't walk down here. So just spend a few, few minutes just thinking about, well, what is it that would cause you from stopping to walk down this alley? And undoubtedly, as you look down it, you will say things like the, the, the darkened doorways, things like the fact that there's nobody around. Uh, on the right-hand side here, we can see graffiti. Uh, we don't know what's at the end, uh, at the end here. Uh, the walls are quite high. Yeah? And this is what we mean by a, a sort of subconscious experience. So when you think about, uh, uh, when you think about an emotion, um, you know, imagine you were, you were walking down uh, across the street and you started to walk down here and you're on the phone to your you know to the office or home and you're just walking down and suddenly you stop and you go hold on this isn't a good idea now the interesting bit is what made you stop well what made you stop are the psychological things and the subconscious things so the subconscious messages are all of the messages that your brain picks up and this is this hidden experience that your brain picks up without you necessarily recognizing them consciously. You're not necessarily aware of them. So your brain picks up the fact that it's a darkened doorways, that there's graffiti, that no one's down here. And it, and it, and it thinks to itself, inside your brain, it thinks, 
wow, Colin's not concentrating. He's talking on his phone to his wife, and he's going to walk down this alley, and, and, and he's going to get mugged or something. I'd better press this button called fear. And it presses this button called fear. I feel scared, and that makes me stop. Okay. So I guess the important part that I'm trying to get to here is, you know, what 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 where you get to is you get to the point where you are taking some form of rational action. You can see here, uh, i.e., I'm stopping. I'm stopping. Why? Because I feel scared. Why am I feeling scared? Well, because my I've seen all of these various different subconscious signals that are that are out there. And I pulled those into my brain subconsciously, and uh, and it's put these together, and it's gone. You better get worried, Colin. And lastly, it's this whole area of psychology. So this is where you're aware of things like the fight and flight mechanism will will kick in. So you know all of these things therefore make up a customer experience, and the same applies with you. Your customers phone in. They want to contact somebody, okay? Uh, and if we think of the uh, if we think of the concierge or go-to assist product, product, okay? You know, people prefer seeing people. They prefer this this interaction. Why? Because there are lots of subconscious messages that we can pull up about the body language. Do I know what I'm talking about? Do you like the 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 way what I'm saying, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. It's not just voice, okay? Uh, and we're picking up these subconscious messages. You're picking up, well, what does the back of my, my, my screen look like? Do, you know, does that look professional? Does it not look professional? Are there 50 million people pulling, pulling funny paces in the background? So when you start to move on to these new types of services, you've really got to think about this uh, hidden customer experience that can greatly affect how your, how your customers feel. And if you're confused by the jargon, um, you know, this is the whole area of these three areas, emotion, subconscious, psychological, are uh, the whole area around uh, uh, behavioral economics. So two words, behavioral, looking at customers, what they do, economics, looking at the effect that that has on, on customers. So those are two key things that, that we want to talk about. And today, we're going to be focusing on this emotional, subconscious, psychological side, because this is the, the hidden experience that greatly affects customers' uh, customers behavior. And again, just so you're clear, um, and uh, James asked the question at the beginning, um, you know, this applies to business to business just as much as it applies to business to consumer. This is one of our clients. This was independently vetted by Forrester. Uh, and this showed that by looking at this type of uh, methodology that Maersk Line, who are the largest container shipping company in the world, increased their net promoter score uh, by 10%, uh, by, sorry, by 40 points in a 30-month period, which lent to a 10% increase in shipping volumes. So 40-point increase in, um, in net promoter over a 30-month period in a very business-to-business -business logistical marketplace by looking at not just rational things, how quickly does the cargo arrive and stuff like that, but looking at the customer's emotions, the subconscious, and the psychological parts of their experience. Okay, so let's again take a step back here um, and let me tell you something shocking. Uh, and what I want to tell you that's shocking is your customers are irrational. Yeah? People are irrational. Okay? Think about the fact that um, you know, how many times have you gone up to an elevator and you've pressed the button 72 times? Well, let me give you uh, a piece of information. The, the, the lift is, or the elevator is not going to come any faster. Okay? Um, it will not. Um, customers are uh, irrational. People are irrational. This is my daughter, Abby, uh, my youngest daughter, and I'm a very proud father. She's got a master's in conservation, uh, and every night she goes to bed with this bunny rabbit that we bought her when she was six days old, and she won't go anywhere in the world without it. So, you know, it's not rational, okay? Uh, and please, if you see Abby, 
don't tell her I've showed you this photograph. This is, uh, I live in Sarasota in Florida, um, and I'm, you can tell I love taking pictures of stuff that's around. This is uh, the beach in Sarasota in Florida, and it says, enjoy your park, and then it tells me all the things that I can't do. So what's the subconscious message there? Okay, so you have to think about what these messages are that you're giving your customers. You go into a hotel room, you put your bag on the bed, you open your suitcase, you go to hang your clothes up, and you're confronted with these. Yeah, and what do these say? These say, "Hello, thief." Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the the issue is that you've got to think about the the subconscious messages that you're given to your customers, and the hidden messages that you're given to your customers. What we know is that they've done a test in a wine store where they played French music uh, in a wine store, and guess what happened to the sales of French wine? Uh, well, the sales of French wine went up by a ratio of five to one. If you ask customers why they bought the wine, they wouldn't say, oh, because they were playing French music. They would say, um, well, you know, just hadn't had the wine for a while, thought I'd give it a go. By thinking about the, uh, the hidden messages that you can give, you can start to put in place deliberate hidden messages. You can start to put in place things, you can start to understand the negative things that you're doing, and you can also start to understand then the positive things that you can start to do. And therefore, when, you're, when, we're, when we're mapping journeys, we are not just looking at rational, we are looking at how the customer feels, we're looking at the um, uh, the subconscious part, and we're also looking at that psychological part. Okay, we're going to have a another little game here to try to get this this over to you to start to get um, how you think and how your customers think. And we're going to have a little game here. Um, I I'm going to show you some pictures, and all I want you to do is I want you to think to yourself as I show you these pictures. Uh, is this picture an, some, a picture of something old, or is this a picture of something new? Okay, so just determine whether you think this is an old picture uh, or a new picture. Okay, so is this an old picture or a new picture? Again, just first reactions, just gut reactions is what we're interested in. Old picture or or new picture? Okay, next one. Is this an old picture? Um, or a or a new picture, okay? And I'm sure in your mind you're starting to think of that. Okay, next one. Is this an old picture or a new picture? And then finally, is this old or is this new? Now, I'm sure with this one, you're starting to think to yourself, oh, I'm not sure. So, so let's go through this. As we went through this first one, I'm sure that all of you would have gone, it's an old picture, right? Why? Well, typically people say because of the hairstyle, because of the phone, because of the color of the magazine, the fonts, those types of things. Uh, this one, you know, old again. Why? Pretty obvious, you know, the, the black and white clothes. The new picture, this one, people t typically talk about the, the cup, and then and then finally, you know, this one here, this uh, red and white one, and this is what stumps people, because now you start to go, well, is it is it old? Uh, you know, it looks quite vibrant. The colours are quite vibrant. It clearly has been painted fairly recently, but it's also clearly something that's old. It's not modern. Um, and and I guess the point I'm trying to make here is. How do we make decisions? And the thing that I find fascinating is this. People make decisions in a nanosecond. People make decisions in a nanosecond. We look at something and we can make a decision. As soon as I put any of these pictures up, I'm sure that, with the exception of the last one, yeah, I'm sure that you made an instant decision. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I guess the interesting thing here then is when you're starting to look at this, unlocking this hidden experience again, how do we make those decisions? Because your customers make these decisions. So what happens is this. We look at something and we human beings want to give it relevance. 
So we look back in our minds and we think to ourselves, where have I seen this type of thing before? I remember those haircuts, I remember those phones, you know, I remember those, those, those things. So we refer back into our memory and we can then make a decision about whether it's, whether it's new or old. Now one of the key things here to think about is the word memory and I'm going to come back to that a, a, a bit later. But one of the other things to think about is your customers will have a perception of you even if they're not customers yet. So if you're in the insurance industry, um, customers have a perception of what it's deal like dealing with somebody in insurance. The fact that they've not been a customer of yours is irrelevant. They have a perception. And with something like, again, the concierge or go-to-assist, this is how you can start to differentiate yourself by starting to do things that customers or other organizations don't do and start to interact with people on a much more, much more human level to differentiate uh, your, your experience. Because we give messages out all the time. Organizations give out messages all the time. You go into a bank and they put pens on chains, which basically say, you know, um, uh, hello thief, We're, we think you're going to steal our pens. Okay? You know, they want you to trust them, but they don't trust, they don't trust you. Um, I, I, I went to Starbucks, um, you know, no doubt, been to Starbucks many times as well. Um, top left hand corner, the first time I went into this Starbucks, they called me um, Colin. Uh, on the second day, I went into Starbucks, they called me Koei. On the third day, they called me Colin. And on the fourth day, they called me Collie. Okay. So you can have a great customer experience, but you've also got to think about the execution of that. Okay. And therefore, when you start to look at this whole subject, okay, you need to start to think about you know, what drives value, because it's okay, you could turn around and say, we want to, and here's something typical I get, okay, uh, clients turn around to us and go, uh, we want to exceed our customer's expectation at every moment of contact, and I say to them, you're mad, okay, no one can afford to exceed customer's expectations at every moment of contact, okay? That's just an impossibility. Um, what you should be doing is you should be trying to exceed your customer's expectation at the point that drives most value for you. And what do we mean by the word value? Well, what we mean by the word value uh, is what you, know, what you get. So increase in net promoter, increase in uh, customer loyalty, uh, increase in, um, in in revenue. James, sounds like you've got a question. Well, I was going to ask you here then with the, the Starbucks here. Uh, I know that sometimes we get some funny, my, my wife's name is Amy, spells mm -hmm. it the French way, A-I-M-E-E. -E. We've got a million different spellings. Um, and so we laugh at it, we giggle at it. I think people probably had a chuckle uh, at, at your example here. The point of the customer experience, though, to exceed their expectations, if I take your example, it would be the moment you're there buying the coffee. The idea that your name was spelled wrong, okay, you laughed it off, you shrugged it off, but you still went back because you got a good enough experience right at the point of sale that you said, you know, I'm going to come back here, correct? Yeah, so, so uh, I, I, it's a good, good question. So um, we, we talk about customer loyalty, okay? Businesses talk about customer loyalty. Um, but, but, you know, loyalty is an emotional attachment, okay? If I turn around to you and said, I've got this really great family, they're a lot cheaper to run than your existing family, do you fancy swapping them, okay? Um, well, you may do that, I don't know, but... <laughs> I would not. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, the point I'm trying to make is your family can do things to you that you don't like. I don't like the fact, didn't like the fact that Starbucks got my name wrong but in the grand context of it it was one little thing that they got wrong over many experiences I've had with them so it's something they need to correct it's something that shouldn't carry on uh, but because I'm a loyal customer of Starbucks I have an emotional attachment to them 
um, then um, then it, it's well, well, they got my name wrong. It's funny, isn't it? Right, exactly. Well, folks, we're, we're halfway through uh, the time that we're going to be spending here today. I've got some additional questions I've already queued up. If you have other questions, James has been active out there with us. It was Roger and a few others. If you have additional questions, feel free to get those into the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to give it back to Colin. We'll continue on, and I'll bring in some more questions as, as I see them. Great. Okay. Okay, so... Let's try to put some of this stuff together because in my experience then when you start to talk to within your organization and you start to say to people let's talk about customer emotions, let's talk about subconscious, psychological, uh, etc. Here's what you're going to get. You're going to get pushback um, and the first thing that people are going to say is show me the money. Prove to me this stuff works. Uh, and this goes back to my DNA of customer experience book, How Emotions Drive Value. So just follow this down. You do things to customers. So you stimulate customers, as you can see up the top here. Because of what you do to them, that affects, you know, a customer responds. They feel something. That's this middle layer. And because of what they feel, that then affects value. In other words, how much net promoter score they give you, how much loyalty they give you, how much revenue they give you. So you do things to customers, they feel something, and that affects value. Okay. So here's an interesting thing. Disney know that when they ask customers what they would like to eat at a Disney theme park, Disney know that people say that they would like to have an option of a salad when they go to a Disney theme park. But Disney also know people don't eat salads when they go to a theme park, they eat hot dogs and hamburgers. So you've got to find out what drives value, not what customers say that they want, what customers do, their behavior. Yeah? And this ties into this whole area of behavioral economics. And this is an important chart for us. This shows at the bottom it's what customers say that they want, and on this vertical axis it's what customers what drives value. So we have things that are conscious, the things that customers are aware of. We have down the bottom here, this is probably the most interesting, these two boxes are the most interesting boxes. This is deception. This is the salad. This is where customers say that I want you to do this, but you provide it to them and they, they that doesn't improve customer satisfaction. This is why many of the net promoter programs are starting to plateau. They are collecting verbatims they are listening to what the customers say, but the customer is deceiving them. In the top corner up here, up in the left-hand side, what we have here are things that customers don't necessarily say that they want, but they still drive value. And I'm not going to go through this in any depth, but this is a piece of research that we did with um, a mobile phone company in Dubai. And the blue here looks at what customers say that they want, the gray looks at what drives value for an organization. You're not going to be able to read all of this, but let me give you some examples here. So at the top here, we've got the things that um, customers are saying they want, a large blue bar. These are the things customers say they want, reliability of quality, reliability of network, speed of problem resolution, etc. Here's the issue. You give them those things, it will not provide you with any more value you will not get anything from this. And yet what we have at the top here are some examples of things where customers are say, not saying they want them, subconscious things, positive presence in my local community uh, as an example, but you can see here a large gray bar. So these things actually drive an awful lot of value. So if I've got a dollar to spend, where do I spend it? Do I spend it on the things that customers tell me that they want? Or do I spend it on these hidden subconscious things that actually do drive value? And it's clearly the latter that you need to, to do. Okay, this is um, moving on and, and, and changing gears a bit. Um, and this is probably one of the most profound things that I have uncovered in the last five to ten years. Okay. Uh, and this is based upon this work by uh, Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, who is the professor of consumer, uh, professor of um, behavioral economics, okay, uh, and he won this Nobel Prize. 
and what he talks about is memories okay loyalty is a function of memory think about it if you are a goldfish they reckon a goldfish remembers something for about three seconds you start swimming around the bowl by the time you've got to the point that you departed from you can't remember it so it's all everything's always new for a goldfish they just continue swimming around and around but loyalty is a function of memory if you can't remember something you can't be loyal to it okay uh, and therefore how memories are formed becomes an important part of a customer experience and memories can even be rewritten I could spend four hours talking about this but Kahneman talks about the fact that we have two selves we have an experiencing self which is in the moment now today this very second and we also have this remembering self and this remembering self is what you will remember from this experience or you know an experience that you had if I said to you tell me what you did last Tuesday would you be able to tell me well probably not because you can't remember anything from last Tuesday yeah but we have this experience in self and we have this remembering self and, and, and learning to how to understand this becomes key uh, and again what Kahneman talks about is the fact that what people remember in an experience and this is all part of this unlocking this hidden experience okay what people remember in, the, in, in an experience is they remember what they, he calls the peak end rule and this doesn't just apply to customers this is about human existence people remember the peak emotion that they felt and that could be positive or negative and they remember the end emotion that they felt so let me ask you a question yeah what is the peak emotion that you are evoking in your customers today and what do you want it to be what is the end emotion that you are evoking in your customers today and what do you want it to be and which of those emotions drives most value for you do you know because if you don't know you should do and things like concierge and and you know the go to assist service can help in that because what they can do if you're trying to get trust customers to trust you then seeing people visually is an absolutely great way of of doing it yeah uh, if you want to feel cared for providing that type of service where you can see people and you can interact personally again can absolutely evoke some of those positive emotions but it's defining what those are at the beginning unlocking the hidden experience goes on um, look what are these faces to you are they interested are they bored are they happy excited well as you can probably tell they're pretty bored okay so what's happening here well there's a whole psychology about waiting and waiting lines so unoccupied time feels longer than occupied time so if you uh, and this is the reasons why they have in, in air, um, airports they have you know the news playing because they're trying to occupy your time this is why people now start playing with selfies play about on their phones all the time etc pre-process wait feels longer the post-process way, getting into the process. Okay, so you go into a restaurant. What's the first thing you do? There's the menu. Why? Because you're in the process. You're starting that that process. Uncertain wait feels longer than a known wait. So if you don't know when the train's turning up or the the flight's taking off or when your delivery is going to get made, that feels longer than if you're being told. So telling customers things becomes important. And also unexplained wait feels longer than an explained wait, which again is why when you're on, on, on the tarmac and they're saying, hey, we're seventh in the queue, we're going to be taken off shortly. Hey, we're third in the queue, going to be taken off shortly. So think about where you are, uh, where you are building these experiences with your customers and think about you know the psychology and this hidden experience these things that you can do to affect the experience 
And James, just to show you that I go into Starbucks a lot, this is a Starbucks I went into, uh, and they had at the end of the, the, the line where you're waiting for your coffee, they had a they had a crossword puzzle, and they the top part is a, a hor hor horoscope for the day, because they know that standing there waiting can be boring, so they're trying to occupy your your, your time. Okay, some examples. Um, I travelled the world a lot. <coughs> have you ever uh, have you ever thought to yourself when you go to a hotel, you know, think about where do you wash your hair? Do you wash your hair uh, in the sink uh, or do you wash your hair in the shower? Well, I don't know about you, I may be strange, but I wash my hair in the shower. So why is it that they always put the shampoo next to the sink? Why do they not put it in the shower? Because that would t show me you know, subconscious message that we are thinking uh, uh, about you. Okay. So this is all about creating this deliberate customer experience. And this is what we mean by a deliberate experience. And what we would look at if we were looking at a customer journey, that we would look at these four parts of, uh, of a customer journey. We would look at the rational things. So these are the things that are um, this is a healthcare journey, so from customer deals with the agent uh, to purchasing policy to receiving the contract, authorization for treatment, etc. We would look at those are the rational things. That's typically what people do. Uh, they 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 talk about journey mapping, and that's all they're doing. But we would look at well, what's the emotional journey that the customer is taking? What emotions are we evoking? What are the subconscious signals? that we are being given at each of these steps and is this causing this poor uh, emotion uh, and uh, what are the psychological points that are being put in here so again down here we can see you know this whole area about uh, peak end rule uh, or maybe it's around uh, confirmation bias confirmation bias is when the way that we look at the world uh, we want to confirm our own opinion. So dealing with call centers is not a good experience. That's what I think. So every time I phone a call center, it's not going to be a good experience because I want to confirm my view of the world. Whichever politics from whichever part of the world you're in, you know, um, if you're left wing, right wing, you tend to look at the world and go, yeah, that's typical what those left wingers would say or those right wingers would say, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're confirming things. Cognitive dissonance is around um, the fight in your brain uh, and this is this whole area of, of what we've called in the new book coming out next year this intuitive customer and the rational customer. So the intuitive customer is making automatic decisions. Yeah, Something's happening, I make an automatic decision. Rather like, is this new or old? It's new, it's old an automatic decision yeah, against a more rational decision. A rational decision is where um, your rational part of your brain will jump in and go, hold on, we don't, we can't be, you know, this is an important choice we've got to make. Let's think about this rationally before we make this decision. It doesn't mean to say that that decision is right, yeah, but what it does mean to say uh, is that you're you're thinking about it. So. When we look at an experience, we are not just looking at this rational side, we are looking at the hidden experience. And as you can see from this, you know, 75% is actually underneath the surface and needs to be thought about. And the key question for me becomes this, is your customer experience deliberate? Is it what you mean to do? Or is it accidental? because most customer experiences, in my experience, are accidental. They don't mean to happen, they just happen. And that's because of the various policies and processes and procedures uh, that, 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 you, that you have. Okay, so um, in, in summary, um, many customer experience programs now are starting to, to plateau. Okay, they've had the gains, uh, but people are now starting to go, 
start a plateau, need to think about something else, but the 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 the, the reality is is they're being constrained by this glass ceiling. They've got to start to, in my view, they've got to start to embrace this and look in this hidden part of an experience. It sounds ironic um, from from somebody that, from me, as somebody that's written books on customer centricity, but oftentimes what I've discovered is customers don't know what they want. Um, you know, no, who said I wanted an iPhone? Yeah, no one ever said they wanted an iPhone. So you have to look under the skin. You have to go into this and look under this skin, and you have to look for this hidden customer experience, and that is the thing that's going to move you on to the to the next level. So as we mentioned earlier, um, earlier the um, uh, you can go on to our website beyondphilosophy.com. Um, uh, if you go under the section of books. Um, and then you select uh, this uh, ebook, Unlocking the Hidden Experience, Short Stories of Remarkable, su Remarkable Practice to Ensure Success. Uh, if you go into there and order it, uh, down the bottom, uh, sorry, at the top, I apologize, left-hand corner, uh, you will see a code. If you put uh, Citrix free uh, in there, you will be able to download uh, this book free of charge between now and uh, Friday evening. Um, so I uh, hope you do, and I hope it's um, uh, of use to you. And folks, you can share what we're going to be doing is we've recorded today's entire event. So you know, if you're reaching when you get the uh, on-demand version and link, which we'll get out to you in about a day or so, feel free to share that with, again, colleagues and, and others that you think can benefit from tuning in. You can obviously go back and listen and review anything that Colin went over. We're going to take the last uh, you know, a couple minutes here on some questions. And one of the big questions, I'll take Michelle's, but one of the kind of big buckets that I've filled up here, Colin, had to do with understanding and how do you learn and how do you know which is these experiences or needs uh, that the customer is not voicing are really the ones where we should be putting some effort into? What are ways to uncover that? Is it through surveys? Is it through focus groups, one-on-one -on -one follow-up conversations? What are some ways to get that information? So good question, and the answer is yes. So it is through surveys. Uh, it is through watching customers. It is looking at what customers do, not what customers say. Okay, so some of the research that we that we showed you back there of Dubai, that's a thing called an emotional signature. That's a specialized form of research that uses a, a thing called structured equation modeling through through the analytics. You can you can get to you can get to the answer of what's really driving customers. If you can't afford to do that, just look at uh, just look at what's happening with your customers. Look at what they look, look at what they are doing. Don't just look at what they are are saying. Uh, and also, it's about being proficient at this. So, you know, I can't have an experience now without pulling it apart and seeing all these little things that, that say these things. So that's about being aware of all these things and embracing this irrationality of, of customers. Because we're irrational, because we all have memories, there is a challenge that I see, and again, has uh, resonated within kind of the, uh, some of the questions here. I have bad memories about customer experience when I've called into certain organizations. Therefore, when I call into another company, I project that onto them. I expect I'm not going to get served. I expect I have to repeat myself four or five times. Can we, as one company, overcome those bad memories that the customer is bringing to us? That seems like it's difficult. Yeah, and and you know I'm not saying that this is the um, so the answer is yes, it is difficult, um, but not impossible. So you need to first thing is you need to recognise that that's 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 going to happen. Secondly, you need to start to to show, tell and show um, your customers that how this is going to be different. Okay, and and again by 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 looking at something like the the go to assist, I think that's a great way. Of differentiating yourself, yeah, you know, we're seeing now obviously the growth of live chat and stuff like that. But if you can get on the the, the bottom end, the growing part of this, you know, your competition may take another um, three or four years to, to to catch up with you. So you have to show it, you have to do it, 
you have to realize that that's happening and you have to start providing your customer with a better experience and eventually they will go, yeah, I had bad experiences with them, but you know what, with this company I have some really good ones. You, you bring up uh, newer tools that are available, video being one of those. Can you talk for a minute about what you're talking to companies now about training people to be on video, whether it's clothing, whether it's the environment that they find. The call centers can be kind of a busy, noisy type of environment. So how are you coaching teams to focus on that aspect? Because I, I think people would, would perceive me a little bit different um, if I was wearing just a T-shirt Yes. Or if I was wearing a hoodie sweatshirt, uh, you know, yes. I've got earrings. I know that says something to audience members. Some people are not professionals. Some people, they don't even notice it until I bring it up. So what do you talk to teams about being on video and, and how they need to take that into account? Yeah, um, and, and, and so absolutely, you know, if you're looking at video, you've got to look at, you've got to start looking at, well, what type of person have we, are we going to be dealing with? Because some people are going to be comfortable in front of a camera. Some people aren't. Um, you've got to look at the background. Does the background look good? You know, what always bugs me with call centers, uh, and I always used to, to harp on about this with my teams when I was back at BT, it's just the background noise. You know, you suddenly get people laughing in the background and everything else, and I'm feeling frustrated as a customer. I'm talking to an agent, and then somebody's bursting out laughing, and I'm thinking to myself, it's not bloody funny, basically. So, yeah, um, you've, you've got to think about all those small, subtle things because they project, project the, back, the brand. So I wouldn't suggest that you suddenly get something like go to assist and just stick it on somebody's desk without the consideration of everything that's happening there, the ambient noise, the types of people that you're dealing with. Um, and then, you know, solicit customer, uh, solicit customer feedback. But, you know, there's loads of good stuff out there on, and, and which we use in our training on just, you know, how to how to project yourself on video and all those types of things. Yeah, no, and, and there's a lot out there. There's some events I've done with Citrix about lighting, about colors, about things like that. And, and it all goes to, I think, the point which I want to you know, just reiterate is looking for a deliberate customer interaction, not just accidental. And I think that's where the accidents can happen. Hey, new tool, let's use it, but you don't know how to use it correctly. And so taking the time to understand the impact it's going to have, and then quickly surveying, you know, if you implement a video chat service to help out in your customer service, quickly surveying that. Are your customers appreciating it? Is there a change? What improvements can be made? And being very open to that. Um, really cool stuff, uh, Colin. Uh, you mentioned, I believe, I said we have four books out. You've got a new one coming out next year, is that what I was hearing yeah, correctly? So, so uh, unlocking the hidden customer experience, the one we're giving away free on this is um, uh, um, is the latest one, and then I've got to literally just finish, gone off to the publisher, uh, they, they're now going to deal with it for the next six months, and it will come out mid, mid, mid next year, I guess. All right. Well, what you can do, folks, you can follow Colin on uh, Twitter, and you see it's at the bottom of the screen as well on that slide, at Colin Shaw underscore CX, customer experience. So uh, very appropriate there. So you can follow him there. Uh, really appreciate, Colin, you being on board here. And again, folks, as I had mentioned, we're going to be sending out a reminder email. You'll get it in about a day. It'll bring you back to the on-demand version. The last thing we're going to ask of you as an audience is if you could take a couple of moments here as we close out short little survey is going to pop up from the GoToAssist and the Citrix Concierge team, again, sponsors for this event. Very short and simple. Did we kind of meet those expectations? Did we give you the, the, the goods that we had promised? And two, if there are other topic areas, thought leadership areas, things like that, either the Colin or others could provide, we'd love to know what other discussions would be of interest to you. So you can fill that out, and then uh, we do a great job of going out and sourcing folks like Colin. So I appreciate everyone taking time to join us for today presentation. Again, Colin Shaw has been with us here. You can uh, follow him, as I mentioned, on Twitter at Colin Shaw underscore uh, CX. Uh, Beyond Philosophy is the company, beyondphilosophy.com. Again, go to the book section. You'll be able to get that free ebook e by putting in Citrix free as the code. So with that, we will wrap things up to the audience. I appreciate your time and effort on the event. To Colin for putting the presentation together. And of course, to our go to assist and Citrix concierge team for sponsoring today's event. With that, we'll wrap it up. Again, my name is James Hilliard, and we do look forward to talking to you all down the road. Thanks. Bye-bye.